the the purpose of uh, today's conversation will be primarily to to talk about how we can turn science into successful businesses um, more specifically how you can look for investors both uh, let's say corporate financial investors or primarily financial investors in this path towards let's say successful business uh, the, the subtitle is basically beyond venture capital because as as far as we're going to see later on um, the venture capital is just one of the, the the various tools that we should be considering whenever thinking about spinning off a technology out of your labs and uh, looking towards the market uh, the first step that i would like to uh, to take with you and is actually being up on, on the very same page when it comes to the definition of what innovation is all about uh, your your activity as researchers is to work in the world of research. And we all know that the world of research is primarily curiosity driven. It's the freedom of looking to extending mankind knowledge. That is your primary objective. When it comes to innovation, we have to be very precise as what innovation is all about, because that is actually the path that we have to follow whenever we are thinking about spinning out a technology or spinning out uh, an invention uh, out of the labs. Now, many people think that innovation is just about having new ideas, although having ideas is, an idea is just a thought of something uh, new or unique, but nevertheless, it's not innovation. Having a new idea doesn't mean that you have something that we can call innovation, nor is an invention. An invention is a new idea that is basically made real, although the only way to transform an invention into a real innovation is once that invention has a socioeconomic effect. So we define innovation, any new ideal, which is turned to be, it's made real, so it becomes an invention. And whenever that invention has a socioeconomic effect, which in the business terminology means that you have a market and you're matching the needs of a specific market target. Um, so you have to think that whenever we are starting thinking moving from research which is primarily curiosity driven into innovation which is primarily market driven we are shifting the paradigm we are shifting the perspective of our activities now what is it innovation very relevant of today well we should uh, have in mind that there's a pain today in every corporation in every industry and that pain is basically the fact that the R&D processes are becoming less effective and less efficient. Now, I made just, this is very high level and rough estimation, but I made an analysis of how much is basically the, the cost of delivering a new patent into the market um, in terms of R&D investments. So, I just took at national level, overall R&D investments and the overall uh, production of patents. And as you might see, there was a significant increase, especially in the last years, in the amount of investment that are required in order to have a new patent uh, filed. That is to say, in other words, that the overall processes of R&D in terms of patent production is getting less uh, efficient. The productivity is decreasing. Uh, when we also analyze the research and development process, in the research and development process, we basically highlight uh, that works basically in all processes, including corporate processes, that um, if we divide the research and development process into, let's say, three main, let's, uh, three main silos, uh, where we have basically different um, sources of financing. Uh, the initial, the very basic research is usually financed through government funds that works also in, in the private sector. So you're looking for government funds to support your basic research and advanced research. And, and therefore what you have is the overall engagement of, of people there is driven by the, the metrics that are required to meet the uh, the selection criteria and the um, 
uh, let's say the uh, the outcome criteria which have been set, uh, set up by the government. So it might be that your instant your incentive is to just file a patent, whatever that means, or publish something new. But as you might see, the relevance of those government funds with respect to business metrics and business models is very limited. As a result, at, at the basic research level or uh, early stage research level, what we, what we notice that there is significant stock of unused technologies, unused technology in terms of the market impact they do have, because actually the main driver, the main metrics for those technologies to be developed was not the market, but it was actually the metrics that were set up by government funds. If we move into a corporate level, so let's say we move a little bit closer to development, there are usually corporate budgets which are available and corporate budgets, they are spread uh, around different business units. So they are looking for technologies which might be considered as platform technologies for the various business units. As a result, the proximity to market is higher, but still the, the metrics there are not related to the short-term business. And as a matter of fact, the result is that the stock of unused technologies is significant, not as significant as it was in the, let's say, in um, basic research, but definitely uh, relevant. When we move into the business unit, at the business unit level, then we have something that is completely different. There's high relevance of development activities. So R&D is pretty much concentrating in delivering short-term results and as as a consequence, uh, the stock of unused technologies is limited. Although what we also notice that here, we're not talking about breakthrough development. We are talking about something that is just usually, um, let's say incremental innovation, which would have an impact on the business on a very short term. What we might say is that the main problem that we have in such a design R&D process or innovation process is that we actually have an enormous amount of waste. That was that waste, which is basically the waste of unused technology, something that was created, but was never used, uh, is primarily caused by the fact that the drivers, the incentive of, uh, for innovating and creating new inventions are not market driven. Uh, in the early researches from um, Professor Chesbro, when we, he started analyzing uh, the, op the, the world of innovation, he basically noted that the, uh, there was a significant stock of unused technologies in big corporations such as Procter & Gamble and Dow Chemicals. Um, he noticed that 90% of Procter & Gamble patents were not applied to any of their products, which were basically on the market. And for Dark Chemical, that percentage was around 81%. So when I mentioned the fact that we have a significant amount of waste in a bad design innovation process, you see here the numbers, 90% and 81% of unused technologies in the market, that is a significant waste. So again, if you're thinking about moving from the world of research into the world of innovation, you should consider that in order to be effective and efficient, you have to deliver something that has an impact on the market and therefore we not enter this stock of unused technologies. Still, beside having an effective and inefficient R&D processes, we also notice in the recent years, two major trends. The first is R&D costs are increasing. Uh, I made just a few, um, a few cases here, but for Intel, the new fabs move from 30 millions to 30 billions in 20 years. Uh, so it's, it's basically uh, two orders of magnitudes that uh, increase in terms of investment required for a new fab in pharma. We notice that in 10 years, um, 18 millions, which were enough 10 years ago to, on, of course, on average, to deliver a new drug into the market, now have raised to something which is very close to 800 millions, if you also consider the phase three. 
But it, I mean, if we also analyze consumer products, uh, the amount of investments required to deliver a successful innovation in the market has doubled, if not increased five times, even for Procter & Gimbal. So that is one trend, high R&D cost, which we also noticed at the beginning in terms of the amount of investment required for a new patent. But on the other side, time to market is squeezed. So there's a need to shorter the time to market to get a new uh, innovation into the market. Uh, in terms of hard disk, uh, in the early 80s, we talk about sixth year for a new hard disk to be delivered to the market. Now it's six months. I mean, now, I mean, in the 1990s. Uh, for pharma, uh, in pharmaceutics, even here, well, we have noticed for the vaccine in COVID that it was an emergency, but nevertheless, there's a need to shorter the time to, time to market as much as possible. And think about mobile phones. So the obsolescence rate is now getting, uh, in, it's increasing uh, in, in, let's say, in a tremendous matter. So we're moving from, uh, basically we're launching a new model every six months. If we stick a little bit to the pharma case, uh, what is the problem that we see in, in pharmaceutics? On, on one side, you all know that we have tremendous pressure when it comes to the reference and pricing schemes. Uh, so pricing schemes are uh, basically creating a sort of, uh, it's basically a threshold or if you mean a cap on the pricing that you have, you can think whenever you are introducing a new drug into the market, which is basically linked to the fact that all governments and the private sector is trying to reduce as much as possible the, uh, the cost of, uh, of a new therapy of a new drug. Uh, that basically is leading several pharmaceutical companies to switch and focus on new therapeutic areas. So, and, and in, because in new therapeutic areas, there's a chance that the, the, the reference pricing scheme is more flexible and you have the opportunity to in, enjoy a high marginality. But of course, if you're focusing on new therapeutic areas, then the probability of success of that new drug is decreasing significantly. Uh, when I say that the probability of success is significantly reducing, this is a study which was published in 2011 uh, in, on Nature and basically describes the, the failure rate of, for each phase of development in the early 90s up to 2004. So you see that in the early 90s, uh, we have uh, a failure rate which was in the range of 67%. So basically uh, in preclinical studies, about uh, two thirds were rejected. Now those two thirds are becoming three quarters. In toxicology studies on human beings, phase one, we move for one third of failures to basically half of the project which are failing. Phase two, phase two basically has seen a dramatic increase from 33% to 70% failure rate. And phase three, which is even worse because phase three is where the majority of investment is concentrated, that the failure rate of phase three clinical, um, clinical trials has increased to 54%. So basically one out of two phase three clinical trials are not successful. Not to mention that also there is a significant failure rate later on after the, the product is launched in the uh, registration phase, so between, and that's basically a quarter. Now, this study suggests if we just take all those percentages of failure, that out of 100 new leads in 1990, we were thinking about, we were hoping to have about nine new drugs into the market, while in 2004, out of 100 new leads, there was a chance to have just one new drug delivered into the market, which basically represents a decrease in productivity of 86% in the overall preclinical and clinical trials process. Still, what has been noticed is that the smaller player have been much more efficient in deliver innovation to the market. So that the numbers that I've shown you previously out of the nature study, are of course, the average uh, numbers in all clinical trials, 
However, if we just, just analyze the, uh, the returns achieved out of the innovation processes in pharmaceutics, then what we discovered, and this is a Deloitte study, that the smaller the company, the higher is the return of their R&D investment. So smaller companies are much more effective in delivering innovation in pharmaceutics. And that is why still is basically on, from the same Deloitte study 2014. So in 2014, which is seven years ago, and that percentage has increased even more, uh, out of all the new drugs which have been delivered into the market, about 60%, so six out of 10 new drugs were not developed inside the company that basically launched the drug into the market. So they have been acquired through external means of development, uh, either the acquisition of the company or the co-development together with a startup company, or why not licensed from a research institution or another company. That is to say, the world of innovation is moving from the traditional innovation, the one that we saw is dramatically inefficient and ineffective into the world of what we call open innovation, where any corporation is looking for outside opportunity to uh, take something to acquire under any mean, uh, something new, a novelty, a new invention and deliver it into the market more efficiently, more effectively, and transform that invention into an innovation. The process which goes from research into, the, into business is called technology transfer. Now, technology transfer is usually represented as, as a linear process. However, it would be very relevant if we think about technology transfer, technology transfer as, as a circle, where actually have a feedback the feedback means that out of any understanding of the market need that you acquire whenever you're delivering something to the market, you get better knowledge of that specific market. So that knowledge has to go back to the research phase and become a sort of input or let's say a target for new researchers to meet those market needs. That is a, one of the major opportunities that a well-designed technology transfer process offers. Delivering back, bringing back into the research phase, the market needs that the technology transfer uh, process enable the research institution to acquire. So the more you know about your end market, the better it will be also for your research because your research can be now focused also in solving specific market needs and you have higher chances to turn that research into a real innovation. Why is that having a market feedback so relevant in the technology transfer process? Because whenever you're trying to figure out how you can establish a good business uh, out of an invention, the first point that any corporation, any investor would look at is basically what are the customer, the customer needs? So who are the prospective customers for that specific invention, that innovation, and what would be the benefit that that innovation would deliver to those customers? I'm talking about customers, of course, in a broad sense, but you also have to think that you have customers in healthcare and customers might be even more complicated that you can imagine. So it's not, the patient is not actually the customer in healthcare, but, uh, he's the one who got the benefit. But then you have the physicians, you have the paramedic units, you have the hospital administration, you have the national health authorities, all those, let's say, we say it in, in design, I think we call them personas, are stakeholders of the final product. And in order to have something that really solves the need of your patient, it's not just a matter of solving one specific clinical need, but it's a matter to ensure that all stakeholders in the selling process are aligned, I would consider that new therapy, that new device, that new drug, something that really creates value for the whole stakeholder network, not just for the patient itself. So the first thing that has to be considered whenever approaching a prospective investor, both corporate or financial is, am I solving specific customer needs and what would be the benefit? with respect to any competing solution. 
And when I mention competing solution, you should always remember that there is one competing solution that is the status quo. So people always have the alternative between purchasing or not purchasing what you're offering them. And in some cases, people do not purchase something. Whatever innovative that something would look like, they prefer not to purchase it, even if they are not competing solutions. Then of course, you look at the market size and market potential. And third, which is not, but definitely not least, it would be very important that you try to figure out how you make money. Because eventually, if you're trying to approach an investor or a corporation, they are not, they're basically for-profit organization. And what is relevant is in order to ensure the sustainability of your, of your business, you have to prove that your product, in a broad sense, your product is a mean of economic and financial sustainability. And in order to become such a mean, you have to ensure that actually there would be customers willing to pay a price that is usually higher, I would say much higher than the overall cost of delivering that something to your customers. And believe me that the way people are paying for a product is much more complex that you can imagine. If we look to uh, the, the technology transfer process in a linear way, and actually we divide that tech transfer process in different phases, depending on the technology readiness level, we move from base research into the commercialization. And actually we, we might recognize three main streams for technology transfer. The first stream is what we call contract research. So you have a corporation that signs an agreement with your institution, uh, it's a joint research agreement and actually the intellectual property rights are usually shared or acquired by a corporation, but let's say it's the corporation that decides to get up to a very low level of technology readiness, uh, join the, uh, have a joint effort together with the research institution and whatever comes out of that counter research is brought forward into the market by the corporation itself. The second process is licensing. So it is actually uh, the corporation that acquires the commercial right out of an invention which was fully developed inside the lab. So you find something new, you file the intellectual property uh, of that invention, then you have an option to sell that intellectual property, to sell the commercial rights and touch the intellectual property to a corporation which will be in charge of fully developing, fully prototyping, fully developing and marketing that innovation on the market. The third stream, which is actually uh, the one that is pretty much more uh, successful recently is spinning off companies. So you may out of the outcome of your research is transformed into an invention. That invention is protected through intellectual property and then you discover that out of that invention, you can create a business model, you can create a company, a venture, and then you look for financing that venture in order to ensure that that venture creates his own structure, creates his own products and gets into the market. And let's say all private operators in technology transfer are primarily focusing on this third step. I'm talking about operators such as IP Group or Karolinska Development. Uh, IP Group is a UK technology transfer um, investment company and Karolinska Development, uh, it's basically the technology transfer fund related to, to Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Now, what do you see? The proof of concept phase, which is actually when the technology readiness level moved from three to five, so you're more or less in the alpha prototyping phase. So you're moving from the lab into the first steps of the real world. This is actually the phase which is the most critical one because you're moving from the curiosity driven perspective that is typical of research into the market driven one. This is really when the 180 degrees change of perspective occurs. And this is also very critical because here you're drafting the final product in a way that actually literature says that 
here you are taking decisions around your final product that would basically influence 80% of the final product lifecycle cost. So besides having just a tiny invention, something that is just filed on a patent, and maybe you have a minimal viable product or you have an alpha prototype, you have your first preclinical studies, but nevertheless, here you are taking decisions that would basically influence whatever comes later on downstream. And that influence is in the range of 80% of the overall life cycle cost, which is significant. So while we, have, we are very far from the market, but still in proof of concept, you have on one side to think about changing your perspective at 180 degrees. And on the other side, here you have to take decisions which would basically influence the success or the failure of your future venture uh, later on. So uh, in order to create a successful uh, venture out of research, we usually think about that is pretty much close to launching into deep space a payload. So deep tech is very much close to deep space and deep tech is the new, the today's definition of, of science innovation. Why is creating a new venture out of deep tech very close as launching something into deep space? Now, if you want to launch into space, something into space, you need a rocket. So you need a vehicle, but that vehicle needs to move. And in order to move such a vehicle, you need fuel. But it's not just the combination of the vehicle itself, the rocket and fuel that is enough because you need a crew, something who knows how to drive that vehicle. So you need astronauts. But you need also fourth dimension. That fourth dimension is the launch phase. How can you lift it off? What are the, the protocols that enable us to move that, the process for lifting that rocket in, into space? And last but not least, in order to have that launch, you need the proper infrastructure. You must have an infrastructure that enables the lift off of your rocket with the crew and with the fuel. So all those five dimensions are the five dimensions that are required in order to lift a payload into space. Uh, those five dimensions are exactly the same five dimensions that we should be looking at whenever thinking about creating a new venture out of science. The first dimension, which is a rocket, is of course your research outcomes and your minds. So your knowledge, the intellectual property you have created, that is the rocket. That is the machine without which we can't launch anything into space. And then you need fuel and fuel is money. And I would say that money is just the fuel, it's not everything. Then you need the crew. The crew is not the one who invented the rocket. The crew is someone who knows how to drive the rocket, how to drive your venture into outer space. Uh, it's like, you, you know, my background is uh, aerospace engineering. So I was trained to design aircraft. And you know that there is this, as I say, we're not pilots, we are aer aeronautic engineers. So we design aircraft, we don't fly them. We know how they fly, but we don't fly them. So there is a significant difference between being a pilot and being an engineer. This is exactly the same difference that we should think about being a founder of a new venture and uh, being the manager of the new venture. Those are two, di two different skills, completely different skills. The launch phase. The launch phase is actually when you met your first customer. Launch customers, we call them. Uh, those customers that are willing to consider your invention, your product earlier than anyone else. You build the whole product around those customers. Those customers are usually very collaborative. They draft the product together with you because they want to capture whatever is new out of your technology, out of your product the earlier. Having launch customers is fundamental for any business, any new business to ensure that you have a proper launch phase. Last, the infrastructure. Infrastructures are not just the lab. Uh, in, in biology, in, in biotech, we always say it, the, ideal, the ideal process will be bench to bed. 
So you want to have an immediate feedback from whatever you see in a clinic, which is the real environment where actually your new drug would work on with respect to what was in the lab. And this is the same for every technology. What is the real life environment where I can test my technology and I can prove that my technology does not just work on a lab, but would work on real life, would work on a real manufacturing line, would work on real computer system. So those are the five dimensions which are all required to start a new business out of science. Uh, the point is, if you want to launch a new venture, you have to speak all those languages because each of those dimensions has a different language. So the, the challenge here is to find someone who, or let's say, to start learning all the five languages, the languages of science, the languages of management, the languages of finance, the languages of your customers, and the languages of the testbed infrastructure. Today, startup companies are the main driver for launching uh, innovations out of science. This is basically the analysis which was made around deep tech by Boston Consulting and Hello Tomorrow, which is a French foundation. Startups are embedded into a network. So they're moving and they have to move in a network of stakeholders, which include corporations, user groups, your uh, research facilities, facilitators, though, that are basically the cultural mediators, those that are speaking the different languages and are enabling you talking with the different stakeholders. The government, this is specifically important for all regulatory issues, is mainly in healthcare and investors. So you have to think that whenever you are creating your new venture, you should be embedded in such a network and you have to speak the languages of all that network. Uh, what is the most important thing you have to, a thing you have to focus on whenever creating your new venture? The right team. Not having the right team is one of the leading cause for failure of any new venture. If you don't have the right team, and especially people who know customers, who know how a specific market work, most probably you end up creating an invention that solves any market need. As a consequence, if you're not solving a market need, which is basically the, the first cause for failures, you're going to run out of cash because nobody will give you a new investment, even if the original idea was very sound and interesting, if you are proving that basically the market is rejected, is rejecting your innovation. And basically your innovation is not as such as just an invention. So not having the right team will bring you into a vicious cycle where actually you probably be delivering a product that is worthless for the market. And as a consequence, won't be able to find the right resources. You won't be able to finance your growth in that market. As we mentioned, the proof of concept is proof of concept phase is the most critical one. And as you might have understood, you have to work on the technology, but you also have to work on people. Uh, in, our, in our fund, which is a technology transfer one, we definitely uh, invest a little money, which is, I mean, we're not doing pharmaceutics, we're doing robotics, medtech, but that little money enables us to move from usually about one or a couple of points of technology readiness level easily, but we do invest in people. We train people, we educate. The principal investigators of our uh, proof of concept investments are all attending an executive MBA that we have designed together uh, with the business school in, in, in Trieste, so close to your premises. But also what we offer is a design thinking approach. Design thinking is, is not a bad word. It's, it's one of the key assets that deep tech has to think about. So science combined with design thinking is the most effective way of moving from curiosity driven to market driven. Design thinking is something is basically a methodology that enables you to put yourself in the shoes of your customers and think how you can satisfy the needs of your customers with your, your technology. And we need testbed 
infrastructure, real, uh, real places where actually we can test those technology. In our case, we, we actually work around robotics, uh, med tech, et cetera. We have a physical infrastructure, which is even close to Trieste. It's a, in, in, in Pordenone, it's actually uh, a full model environment while a full industrial chain is represented. And here we test our technologies embedded in a full scale real environment. Uh, and we also train our researchers to understand how a complex environment influences a technology. And believe me, this is a factory, but you see the picture, the, the, the top picture in the middle, that was the first wave of researchers we trained there. And then within that team, we have a team that works in Silico drug discovery. And these years we have trained also another platform working in drug discovery and, and, a, and a platform working on wound dealing. They understood that how a technology fits the complexity of the real world environment. And that re requires specific methodology that you can learn only if inside a complex environment, which is not a lab, it's a real facility, but it's a real facility where you can play around without disrupting anything. So how about the financing tool for startups? Uh, first of all, when it comes to startup, you have to think that startups have uh, various, let's say, phases. There's, I mean, even if you have a new company, it will go through different phases. The idea phase, minimum viable product, launch in the market and scale up. So you go through uh, four phases of life of a startup company. And for each phase of this life, you will have different uh, let's say, economic and financial needs. Sales usually take place primarily when you scale up, but at, the, at least in the first two phases, you won't have any sales, you won't have any turnover, but you have to make significant investment in R&D, marketing, and human resources. Uh, people would say it makes poor sense to invest in marketing in the early stage. That is a problem, that is basically a, a big mistake. You should remember on example that brand is something that would survive your patent. Patent expires, brand will remain forever. And there are companies which brand is so strong that actually is stronger than their patents. You don't buy a Ferrari because it has patented technology. You buy a Ferrari because it's a Ferrari. And that works for every industry. Even in pharmaceutics, it would work. If your brand is sound, then your product is perceived as sound. Now, uh, think about what is happening today is with, let's say, word of mouth around vaccines in COVID. Some companies have now a reputation which is higher than other companies, besides being all very sound from a scientific point of view. But it's a brand reputation. It's not just the, uh, the IP strength that changes or the quality of their product that changes. And also when it comes with, we said sales turnover, profitability, you won't see profitability probably up to the end of your process and cash, you always need cash. Even if your company starts selling, you need to make further investment to grow on a global scale and you need cash. And cash is basically what drives investments. In draft investments, which are different with respect to the phase, uh, there is a different set of terminology. Uh, we call pre-seed both in Europe and the US when you are in the idea phase. When you have a minimum viable product, we call the seed investment. When you get into the first step into the market, we call a round in the US or startup round in, in Europe. And that all successes, uh, let's say, uh, successive round are named with letters in the US or generally uh, the term, um, let's say, indicated as later stage round in Europe. As we said, venture capital, many people think venture capital is the one stop shop for any kind of investment, and this is not reality. Venture capital is a very specific kind of funds investing only after the companies are usually already in the market. 
So they move from, let's say, early stage A round stages up to B, C round. They're not investing in seed or pre-seed and usually they're moving more on a scale up phase. This is actually the trend that we see in the market. There are other funds that are focusing more early stage, technology transfer funds such as ours. We do also make pre-seed investments or seed funds, which are basically focusing on, on the seed phase. But also there are many other kinds of investors, which we call informal investors, that are focusing on the different stages of, uh, of a startup company. So that is to say, you think about venture capital, but venture capital is just one of the various tools you should consider whenever thinking about financing your idea. There's a significant difference between informal investor and formal investors. Uh, informal investors are people investing their own money. So the decision whether to do an investment or not is made by the very same person who actually owns the money. And they have no deadline in their investment. So they can take an equity, an equity share in a company and keep it forever. And that is a significant difference with respect to funds. In funds, uh, the investors, those providing the money to the fund are basically different with respect to the people who are in charge of taking the decisions whether where the fund will invest or they invest. The fund manager, which is actually my job, is not the one that provides the money in the fund. Our funds are coming from, for example, the European Investment Fund. So they're coming from other institutional investors or uh, private investors. But you see, I'm taking the decisions where the money has to be allocated without owning that money, which is very much different with respect to an informal investor that decides where to put his own money, which means I'm operating under a, a significant protective umbrella, protective for our investors of regulations, compliance, et cetera, et cetera, which of course requires us to move into specific processes and comply to specific authorities. And we have a deadline, which is usually 10 years. A fund lasts for 10 years. That is the golden rule in our market. That is to say, whenever the fund expires, we have to sell the shares. We have to withdraw the shares that we have in any asset. We cannot keep in our book uh, uh, any asset after the fund expires. So we have a time constraint, which is relevant. We, we are by definition temporary shareholders. And that's why we are focusing in exiting. We are focusing in exiting because we have to give the money back to our investors. It's not our money and do it within a very specific time frame. So those are the main differences. And you understand why certain investors, informal investors might act in a certain way and why funds they are all acting following very specific directives and rules. So who are informal investors? I will be very fast here. Usually in the pre-seed phase, when you have an idea, we call them 3F plus one. 3F are family, friends, and fools. Usually people you know, or foolish people who are willing to uh, basically bid their money into an idea of a new venture. Plus one means another F, which is actually founders. Uh, it's very common that you establish your venture and you don't have money. So you work for the venture. And typically, one way of investing in your venture is that you work with a very limited salary because you don't have money for paying even your own salary. It's called, in several cases, bootstrapping. This is your investment in a company. Then we have business angels. Business angels are... Uh, wealthy individuals, usually former entrepreneurs or um, executive, the beauty of business angels is that they, of course, they provide money, which can be in the range of some hundreds, thousand euros, but they provide experience. They are investing, for example, business angel investing in medtech. They're usually people with a previous medtech experience. So they know they're bidding on something because they know the industry. They're not just putting their money there. They're putting their experience, their knowledge, their network. And this is why they can be considered, if very skilled, not just 
a treat their their values not just the money they are giving to the money but also their their knowledge of the industry and they would definitely help you avoiding the mistakes that usually whenever someone is new to the venture world would make crowdfunding is getting more uh, common these days it's a way of collecting money through uh, a plurality of people uh, actually the platforms their web-based platforms operated by authorized operators it's a good way of telling to everyone your story and collecting money from basically anyone uh, in a very regulated and protected environment and this is becoming very common in these days when it comes to funds let me give you some numbers uh, here I'm showing the differences in the different markets. So when we talk about uh, investment funds, uh, those are the numbers all over the world, uh, 2019 numbers. As you see, uh, the money is primarily focused on late stage investment. Uh, the percentage of late stage investment spans from 55% average Europe to 64% uh, in Italy, 2019 data. Uh, and if we look to the size of the round, uh, basically seven rounds out of 10 in the US are above 25 million. So the small rounds, which are usually focusing on the very early stage are less. That percentage drops to 50% in Europe and 44% in Italy. But if you think about Italy, 44% of the 600 millions we are referring to in rounds exceeding 25 million, then you see that we are talking about a very limited number of rounds. So it's basically half of those 600 million. So let's say it's about uh, 260 million. It's 44% is about 264 million. And that basically means that it's less than 10 rounds. So in Italy, 10 companies received basically half or 44% of the total money which was invested in early stage in, in, in venture capital in Italy in 2019. Um, this is the uh, amount of money that is invested by phase. Uh, please look to have a look to the red line. That is the median line, while the, the black line is basically the average one. You see the medium and the average has, are very, very spread around. So the medium, the average is very close to the 75th percentile. That means that our market is a market where actually the money is focused on bigger rounds, even early stage, while the average, the, 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 the chances to be funded is much lower than you might expect. So there are some, let's say outliers, the distribution is not at all symmetric. So there are outliers, but reality is much lower than we do expect just looking to the averages. So, in the US, the medium investment uh, size for a seed round is less than a million, which is pretty much close to what we notice in, in Europe. If we move in later stage rounds, such as in A round or uh, whenever the companies are basically getting the money from the first venture capitalist, again, here you see medium and average are spread very asymmetric uh, distribution here the medium one says is about five millions in the us and approximately two millions in europe on later stage rounds again asymmetric distribution this is getting even more asymmetric you see the average is much higher than the 70th percentile and we have a medium which is about seven millions in the us and four or five millions in europe uh, how long does it take to go from round, round to another? Starting from zero, well, actually zero is the time when the company was established. Uh, Italian data, the granularity was not that so good. So just take those figures, uh, it's my calculation, but European data and US data, they are pretty much more accurate. Uh, it takes about two and a half years to get funded with the seed round both in Europe and US. So your expectations whenever you're thinking about establishing the companies that you have to wait for two and a half years 
before you get funded by a seed round. Then the time squeezes. So after the seed round, you have higher chances to get an A round. It's usually one year after. And then later stage round, well, later stage rounds, which are more than one, you see they're pretty much later. So you have, of course, different rounds, but the medium positioning in time is about seven and a half years and eight years. So don't think that your adventure in running a startup company will be short in time. It will take a long time before you get funding and a longer time before that funds increases and you have chances to be exited. Uh, we should also not forget about corporate venture capital, corporations investing in early stage startups. They are usually, they are today representing about 45% of the market. So that is a significant opportunity. Think about corporations, they're usually investing in what we call the startup phase you see here, which means once you, you have already some interesting results, not in the seed phase, in startup phase, but the percentage of investment in startup phase is basically double of the percentage of traditional venture capitals. So uh, corporate venture capital, corporate investment for uh, startup companies can be very interesting and should be taken into consideration whenever launching your uh, startup company. Uh, Last, that was just a case study. It's the Insidico drug discovery company we invested in. Uh, but I think I basically ran out of time. So I would like to leave the floor to your questions, if any. And, uh, and, and if required, of course, I will talk about the, uh, the case study, but I prefer to answer to any question we might have.